to to cover this press conference uh, with an update on the public health emergency. And they've given me a lot of information to cover today, so I kind of want to get right into it. Um, today we're reporting 421 new cases for a total of 36,925 statewide since the inception of this public health emergency. Uh, sadly, we are reporting 39 new deaths, bringing the total number of deaths to 2,000, I'm sorry, 2,545. The, the good news today is that we've seen a further decline in the number of people who are in the hospital and on ventilators. Uh, so today, we're reporting 867 patients hospitalized, 104 on ventilators. It's actually been since the end of March that we've seen hospitalizations this low. Just 30 days ago, there were twice as many individuals in the hospital with COVID-19. And because we didn't have a press conference yesterday, I feel compelled to get into yesterday's numbers just a little bit um, because you may have been jarred a little bit with the 1,188 cases that were reported yesterday. Of those cases, 682 came from 23 labs that reported for the first time yesterday. Um, they reported electronically to, to LDH. And some of those cases stretch back as far as March the 25th. So many of those individuals recovered. If they were ever symptomatic, they've, they've recovered and, and, and so forth. Um, but about 506 of, the, of yesterday's report would be what we would consider a, a new uh, case. Uh, and the percentage positivity, which is obviously very important, um, the, the percentage of total tests that returned positive, um, on all lab results that were reported yesterday was 6.1 percent. If you look at that number that I gave you that represented the new cases, it was 6.4 percent. And the national goal we have is to get positivity below 10 percent. And so we, we're obviously trending in the right direction uh, there as well. We know that we are beginning to see the impact of comprehensive testing across, across congregant settings. Uh, and workplace outbreaks. Obviously, this is critical as we move forward. And we know that as we test these settings, we're going to be reporting more cases. The good news is that when we go in there, uh, these congregant settings, most of these cases that we discover are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. But they're still very challenging because the individuals are nevertheless contagious. Uh, and the CDC reported I think it was yesterday, their, their current estimate of the number, I should say the percentage of all COVID cases that are asymptomatic is 35%. So this is, this is obviously a, a real challenge for us and everybody else across the country and across the world in dealing uh, with this public health emergency, but it's also why we have to go into these congregant settings. Uh, and in and, and many of the congregant settings, they don't necessarily pose a tremendous threat to the public because they are in a setting, but, but nevertheless, these tests have to be run. We have to identify the individuals and then start the contact tracing associated with that if we're going to be able to hold the number of cases down. As you will remember, our goal for the month of May with respect to testing was to reach 200,000 tests. Today, uh, May the 22nd, I can tell you we've gotten to 143,577 thus far in the month of May. Um, those, those are the reports uh, that have been given to LDH on testing. So we're on our way to meeting that goal. We are about 56,000 tests uh, short of the goal with nine days to go. I do want to make sure that everyone understands that it is safe, easy, and no upfront cost to you to get tested. And in fact, under the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, Louisiana Medicaid will cover testing for coronas, coronavirus for Louisiana residents who lack health insurance. So even the uninsured uh, can have their test done at no cost and Medicaid will pay for it. Coverage includes not just the diagnostic testing, but also testing related services. This coverage will be available until the end of the federal public health emergency. 
uninsured individuals can apply for this coverage uh, in their doctor's office. And if you don't have a provider or you don't know where to find one, you're not sure how to get connected to be tested, I'm, I'm encouraging you to call 211. Dial 211 um, and you'll be able to find a testing site that can assist you. There is also a list of testing sites statewide available at ldh.la.gov slash coronavirus. Um, the good news is, a bit of good news is with Medicaid expansion, we actually have an uninsured rate now that is lower than the national average. Uh, it's about 8%. Um, and we know that those folks on Medicaid are going to get the coverage for their testing as well. With respect to testing also, uh, I can tell you that there has been a concerted effort and partnership between the Louisiana National Guard, GOSEP, and the Office of Public Health uh, to stand up uh, mobile testing sites across the state of Louisiana. Um, that's happened in regions 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8. Uh, I can tell you regions 4 and 9 will start Tuesday and 6 and 7 uh, the following week. In region 8, which is the Monroe area up in northeast Louisiana, that mobile testing started this week. Uh, and these, these testing uh, sites, these mobile testing sites, tested right at 1,000 Louisianans this week. Um, so that's, that's going to really help us to get to our goal of not just reaching 200,000 tests, but testing the individuals we think need to be tested, either because they're in a parish that has been ad inadequately tested thus far, because they're in a congregant setting, or they're in a relative hotspot. And, and so that's, that's how we're deciding uh, where these um, test sites are going to operate. But I do want to thank the National Guard, uh, GOSEP, and the Office of Public Health for the work that they're doing uh, to conduct those mobile testing sites. We also have some very good corporate partners out there with respect to testing. I want to single out a couple of them today for you. Walmart, uh, it has sites in Shreveport, Laplace, Baker, Baton Rouge, Mansfield, Plaquemine, New Iberia, and Jonesboro that are up and running with testing. Uh, New Roads, uh, the Walmart and New Roads will open tomorrow. In addition, uh, another corporate partner that's being very, very helpful is CVS. Uh, they recently announced that they're expanding no-cost testing through several of its drive-through lanes in, in our state. Uh, there are now eight CVS locations in Louisiana offering this service. Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Metairie, New Orleans, Shreveport, and Slidell. Uh, more sites will be added later, um, but for more details on exactly where these stores are and the hours they're going to be operating, you can go to cvs.com cbs.com for more details. We have not given you an update yet on remdesivir, um, but we want to do that today. It, it happened to be that on the day that uh, Dr. B, you and I were in, in Washington in the Oval Office, uh, that Dr. Fauci at that press conference uh, made the announcement that remdesivir had shown positive results to the point where the clinical trials were going to stop because there was a clear uh, efficacy to the drug uh, and that it was safe uh, for hospitalized patients. Uh, and, and since that time, the maker of remdesivir, Gilead, has been supplying uh, certain amounts of the drug to the country. And we have now received uh, three allocations uh, from the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, and we received the first allocation on May the 14th. It was 1,200 vials of remdesivir. Uh, those 1,200 vials, and, and one vial is one treatment, uh, but they were delivered to 44 hospitals across the state of Louisiana. The second shipment of 3,366 vials came in on May the 19th. They, too, were delivered to 44 hospitals across the state of Louisiana. Today, we will receive our third allocation of 3,828 vials. They will be delivered to 47 hospitals. The hospitals are selected based on their COVID-19 caseload. Any hospital with five or more COVID-19 inpatients uh, receive an allocation. Hospitals with fewer than five uh, COVID-19 inpatients can request remdesivir if they have a patient that they believe that the drug would help. And I, and I did want to point out that there's two different 
uh, treatment regimens for uh, COVID-19 patients with remdesivir. One is basically a five-day treatment. The other is a 10-day treatment. And so on, on average, uh, it's about uh, seven vials to treat one uh, individual. I am pleased to report that we've made progress on the contact tracing side. We have now hired 450 Louisianans as contact tracers. You recall, to, recall that our target last week uh, was to have 250 uh, contact tracers hired. Obviously, this is a very important part of our effort to keep the cases down as we re-engage more sectors of our economy, get more businesses open, get more employees back to work, get more customers in our stores, uh, in our restaurants, and, and get people uh, back into church. Um, and, and other aspects of, of daily life as well. And, and so we uh, obviously uh, are looking for uh, the contact tracing effort to be done in conjunction with the testing uh, so that we can identify those individuals who need to be uh, told um, that they're positive or that they came into contact with someone who was positive uh, so they know how to take care of themselves and their families uh, and can make prudent uh, decisions uh, about making sure that they're limiting their, their contact, that they're um, on guard for symptoms that may develop and, and that sort of thing. And the reason this is so critically important, uh, well, there's lots of reasons, I suspect, but it is, in my mind at least, because 35% of the people out there who are contagious don't know, who have COVID-19 don't know that they have it and they're contagious. And so getting this bit of information uh, should be very, very helpful. And we look forward to working with the public uh, over the coming weeks and months uh, in order to give them that information so that they can make the prudent decisions necessary. On another positive note, the Department of Education here in Louisiana began taking applications on Monday for the federal pandemic EBT program. It provides food benefits for students who receive free and reduced uh, price school meals and this is done through the SNAP program in partnership with at the state level uh, the Department of Children and Family Services but at the federal level with the US Department of Agriculture so this this was uh, approved as of Monday uh, but as of this morning applications for nearly 330,000 eligible children have been processed this is more than half of the eligible population uh, so that's been able to to, uh, to get done this week. Uh, parents can apply on the Department of Education website at louisianabelieves.com. And I want to thank all of the folks at DCFS and all the folks at the Department of Education and the various school districts and so forth who are working so hard to make sure that adequate nutrition is available to kids across Louisiana who would typically be at school uh, five days a week getting one or two of their meals uh, at school. So it's a very important uh, effort that they're making. I appreciate it. I do hope that everyone will have a happy and safe Memorial Day uh, and that they will take the time to pause, reflect, give thanks, pray for all of the men and women in uniform who have made the ultimate sacrifice uh, for our freedom. That is the purpose for Memorial Day after all. Uh, obviously, this Memorial Day will be different from any others that we've ever experienced because the public health emergency remains um, uh, in place, as, as does the uh, current Phase 1 order. Uh, so I do encourage everyone to um, be cautious. Uh, we've done a lot over the last couple of months to really slow the spread, bend the curve, reduce hospitalization uh, capacity, I'm sorry, hospitalizations, increasing the capacity that's available and reducing vent usage and, and all these other good things. Uh, and the gains are important, but they are fragile. And so we do encourage everyone uh, to be mindful, to wear a mask when they're out of their homes, whether indoors or outdoors, and, and uh, to spend uh, or stay six feet away from others to make sure you're social distancing, continue to wash your hands frequently, soap and water. Uh, and for those people who are more vulnerable, uh, you are absolutely safer at home. Uh, and I know we've covered this up a lot of times, but those people are the 165 and older. Those individuals with a chronic underlying comorbid health condition such as uh, hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease, obesity. 
Um, and I will tell you, uh, we're doing much, much better, but in many ways, the virus is still in control, and we need to uh, remember that. Uh, we're certainly not back uh, to normal. You may have also seen that the CDC recently released information that says that we have a much greater chance of contracting the virus through airborne particles uh, that uh, are made airborne because someone who has the virus, uh, whether they're um, symptomatic or not, but when they speak, when they cough, when they sneeze, these particles become airborne. Uh, they then get breathed in and, and by someone else. That is the main way that these, the virus is, is spreading. Uh, there is still uh, some risk of spread through contaminated surfaces, but that's not the primary uh, threat for the spread of, of the virus. And again, that's why the masks are so important, because the masks cut down dramatically on the distance that those, those airborne particles can travel, uh, and, and then they won't be breathed in by, by others. So we're asking that uh, over this weekend and, and even thereafter, obviously, don't congregate in big groups or spend a lot of time with people who aren't in your direct household unless you can spread out, wear your mask, be socially uh, distant. Uh, I know this is the start of summer. Community pools are not open. Lap pools at gyms and fitness centers, uh, centers may be open. Uh, you know, we, we believe, if you look at this number that we updated on Monday, that there's more than 26,000 uh, individuals who are recovered. Um, and we've had 37,000 just about test positive. So we know that there's COVID out there. Um, and, and if you just do the math, then, then obviously we're looking somewhere north of, of 10,000. But those are among the tested people. There's a lot of folks out there with COVID who have not uh, been tested. So there's a lot of, of the virus out there encouraging people to be mindful of that. Uh, and again, especially if you are older or, or vulnerable. Um, and if you travel this weekend, please do so uh, with, with all of these things in mind. Uh, do understand that depending on your destination, you may have uh, restrictions that are, that are a little bit uh, more than what we put in place at the state level. I know that's going to be the case for anyone who travels uh, to New Orleans, for example. Uh, and I will tell you that I get accolades, uh, well, from the White House Coronavirus Task Force members, uh, from different governors and folks from around the country about the degree to which uh, the New Orleans area, Orleans uh, Parish, Jefferson Parish, was able to take what was the highest growth rate anywhere in the country and, and we think probably at one time anywhere in the world and really turned that around in short order. Uh, and I want to thank all of the elected officials uh, in that part, really all over the state, but, but certainly in that part of our state, business leaders, faith leaders, and the general public, because they all made that happen. Um, but obviously, there's still more COVID there um, than in uh, most parts uh, of the state. Uh, and so there, there continue to be restrictions there that may be a little uh, more uh, than, than we have statewide. And, and I think that that's important uh, because New Orleans obviously wants to be known as a safe place uh, in order for people to be, uh, to actually be safe, that's, that's number one, but to feel safe and to return uh, to New Orleans uh, as tourists, as conventioneers, and, and all, of, all of those sorts of things. And, and so just, just wanted to highlight what's going on there and let people know if you're going to be in that area, uh, in, in Orleans Parish, over this Memorial Day weekend. Um, you may have some additional restrictions uh, on your activities, and for good reason. Um, so I do want to uh, remind everybody that the way we get to phase two is by making sure we're doing everything we're supposed to do while we're in phase one. And we're accumulating data now that will inform our decision later on about whether we go to phase two. We're currently in phase one by an order that, that doesn't expire until June the fifth. So that's that's where we are right now. Um, Monday is a holiday, so I, we don't I have a press conference scheduled for Memorial Day. The next one that we anticipate having will be on Wednesday uh, of next week. So with that, we will take some questions. And Shauna, would you please get some water? I give Joseph the day off, and I don't I don't get water up here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Governor. House and 
Yeah, well, the I know the speaker and the president uh, both tried to call while I was at a lunch meeting, uh, and I know that's what they were they were calling to tell me. Um, and of course, before I went into the lunch meeting, I, I knew about that, so I'm certainly not surprised. Um, obviously, they have to have a special session because it doesn't appear that they're going to get through the bills that are absolutely essential uh, before the start of the next fiscal year. And the, the fiscal year starts. Thank you. The fiscal year starts on July 1st, uh, and and it, it's clear that they're not going to uh, get through the budget, the capital outlay, and, and a number of other critical bills. So I believe that they're they're. Is going to have to be a special session um, and you know it doesn't cause me any problems that they're causing calling themselves back into session that's something that the Constitution um, gives them the authority to do it, it's a, a little bit uh, I think problematic to have 41 objects in the call uh, because I think that that uh, it'll operate more as a general session uh, rather than a concentrated spe uh, special session where we're focusing on those things that absolutely have to get done. Um, and, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that they weren't able to use the time that they've had uh, from May 4th through June 1st to get done uh, the essential work of the state of Louisiana. But, but let's hope that they can do it in the time that they've given themselves, but I think between June 1st and, and June 30th. Uh, obviously, if they don't get it done by June 30th, there, there will be a major disruption. And so, so we'll work with them to make sure that we get uh, those essential bills done. And, and uh, so, no, I'm, I'm not surprised, and, and they did uh, try to call me today. And so just to be clear, you're not planning on calling your own special session? No. No, there's nothing that I would ask the legislature to do that isn't in their call. And obviously, there's 41 objects in their call. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Governor, the, the, there has been a lot of discussion in this session about contact tracing and concerns mm -hmm. about privacy rights, mm -hmm. concerns that people could get penalized in some fashion um, if they don't agree to participate. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously that came up in appropriations yesterday. And the LDH attorney did not definitively shoot down the possibility that penalties could be coming down the road later. And I guess I'm wondering, um, where do you stand on penalizing people that don't participate in all the concerns about privacy? Well, first of all, there, there's always a legitimate concern around privacy. With respect to contact tracing and our efforts and whether there's going to be penalties or coercion, all of those uh, concerns and fears are unfounded. Uh, we have said from the very beginning uh, that we will be undertaking a robust contact tracing effort in order to keep the cases down as we move forward and re-engage uh, more of our economy and get people uh, moving again and, and making contact uh, with one another. It's critically important to this overall process as we continue to navigate our way through this public health emergency. But we've also said that at no point is contact tracing going to mandate anybody to do anything. Uh, so if you get a call and you're told that you, you tested positive and we want to find out who your contacts are, obviously we hope that you would be a good enough neighbor, uh, that you would provide information so that we could then call uh, those folks uh, that, that are meet the definition of the close contact so that we can contact them and let them know so that they can look out for themselves and their families and their communities and so forth, monitor their symptoms more closely. Uh, and potentially that they would agree uh, to to isolate themselves for some period of time un until we they could be confident that they don't have COVID-19. Uh, uh, so so there there's no penalty for anyone. Those there's no mandate that anybody participate. Um, and again, this is one of those efforts where. I would encourage people to think not along the lines of what you have a right to do or right not to do, but think about what is the right thing to do. Uh, and contact tracing, by the way, wasn't invented two months ago when COVID-19 struck. It's been a useful tool in public health emergencies uh, for a long, long time. Uh, it's been done here in Louisiana uh, on multiple occasions probably not at the scale that we're going to be doing it now, 
but the but the the whole uh, uh, effort of contact tracing is is the same as it has been for a long time. Yes, sir. Have you discovered any other crawfish farms uh, that have uh, these corral rates? Uh, Do you have updated numbers for how many yeah. cases you discovered there? I'm going to have to ask uh, Dr. B to come up. Uh, I can tell you that part of the numbers that we reported yesterday, um, the the new numbers, um, remember I broke them out because 23 labs reported for the first time and, and many of those cases were old. But of those cases we reported yesterday, I do believe that some of those came from um, migrant worker uh, congregant settings uh, affiliated with crawfish processing. Uh, but I'm going to ask Dr. B.U. to come up and, and share what specific information you might have about that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll answer it more broadly. We continue to work as a part of contact tracing and as a part of public health's mandate um, to investigate clusters around the state. Um, and, and every day looking at any of those cases that come in, identifying if there's a congregate setting associated with it, if the difference between somebody who is an isolated case and a congregate setting is that then we have to do a lot more work going in, finding out, you know, who else might be exposed. And, and uh, our guidelines as of two weeks ago that we released is that we want everybody tested in a congregate setting. So whether that's a workplace or an adult residential facility, um, uh, the same same sort of approach is being taken. So uh, we continue to do that um, throughout the state. How many crawfish facilities is the state currently investigating as congregate setting with an outbreak? So I don't have that specific number. And I would just note, you know, apropos of the point that the governor was making about uh, privacy and confidentiality, that is a standard across public health, and the reason is to ensure that people feel comfortable coming forward to us. It's, it's our job in public health to make sure that everybody uh, gives the information that we need so that we can identify who's at risk from an outbreak and get um, uh, um, you know, resources to those people, find out who may be at risk. And uh, the challenge uh, with uh, giving too many details there is we actually dissuade people from coming forward. If they know the risk of, of telling Dr. B's team is, is that I'm going to have a, a news crew showing up tomorrow asking me lots of tough questions, uh, understandably, I worry about what happens to the next congregate setting that's next door, what happens to the next um, uh, you know, encampment. Uh, that's concerned now and, and is going to hide cases. And so that's the reason uh, that we uh, don't give that level of granular detail because just like people need to know that their privacy is secured in our contract, contact tracing system, we also want uh, businesses, congregate settings to know um, we're going to come and do our job and make sure that, that people are safe, make sure the public is safe, and we're going to do that in a way uh, that really honors what we need to do to, to end this epidemic. No, we, we've been releasing uh, numbers every day of, of cases. We're trying to, to give information about different congregate settings that we're testing. Um, but uh, I certainly wouldn't commit to say that every time a, a new farm uh, is identified, we're going to give you uh, who that is, what the number of individuals are. And that's not because there's not a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed, but from a public health standpoint, that uh, relationship between uh, the organization and public health, being able to make sure that there's transparency, because most important is getting uh, resources to the people who are being uh, diagnosed with COVID, that's what is our driving principle. Um, and we're doing that in a way that also transparently shows the number of cases that we have statewide, uh, and we're doing that in a way uh, that, that honors the, the public interest um, in anything that, that uh, impacts them. And, Again, as you've seen in other outbreaks, and the governor made this point, um, you know, there's times where an outbreak um, happens and doesn't have an impact on the broader public, and that's uh, perfectly protected. There's times where um, there is an outbreak, uh, let's say, you know, in a, in a restaurant, and there is a potential risk to other people who might have eaten at that restaurant. You know? And in that case, we do give information and say to the general public, hey, if you were uh, at, uh, dining at this restaurant between this time period, you may um, uh, be at risk, and we want you to contact us if you have any of the following symptoms. So the public should rest assured knowing that if there is a risk to the public from one of these, we do uh, supply that information. We do uh, reach out to the public. And if we're not doing that, it, it's because um, it's, it's, it's not a threat to the public, and what's most important is understanding how those people who are impacted are, are safe and tested. But even before you were releasing the nursing home information that we're now requiring to be released, y'all were at least providing aggregate numbers about those facilities so we could understand the scale and scope of how, much of, how many of the cases were actually in these facilities versus out in the general population. So I don't understand why you wouldn't do the same for um, those profits there are work sites just like meat packing plants in other states that can release the numbers about those. So 
so again, we've been reporting those numbers, and, and maybe we're just talking about two different things. Um, you know, we're not going to be reporting, you know, what's uh, every congregate setting in the state, because there's going to be dormitories, there's going to be all sorts of different settings that may count as congregate settings, uh, in the same way that we're doing for nursing homes, for instance, where uh, each one is labeled, you know what their census is, uh, and, and that's a lot of detail, just because, frankly, that's more data than, than um, uh, we can handle and that I think is, is useful. Um, but uh, certainly where we find outbreaks that are of, of um, uh, impact to the public, we are sharing that information and we'll continue to do so. To that same point, how are you guys handling the addition move towards phase two? You talked about this idea of percent positivity of the test. Yep. But if we're going to be expanding mass testing to congregate settings, that includes not only asymptomatic people, but also places where you know, these cases aren't really at risk to the general public. Are you backing those cases? Yeah, so I mean, we're, we're not backing any cases out of the data. The, the point with the work that we're doing is that the only way to control the COVID outbreak, the only way for us to get resources to places that we need is to turn over every rock and test anybody that we think uh, has a high likelihood of, of, of being infected. Now, for the general public, that's still people who have symptoms. In contact tracing, when we reach out to somebody, if they're a contact of a case and they have no symptoms, right now you're not going to get a recommendation from public health to say, we need you to go get tested. If you develop symptoms, that's a different issue. But in congregate settings, to the point that the governor made, we know that that asymptomatic spread now in a concentrated area actually does fuel uh, the further spread of, of COVID-19 in those areas. And so we are going to uh, find uh, as many of those cases as we can. That means not only testing that entire population and the staff there, but retesting that population that's uh, negative to see if people do change their status uh, over time. And we're not trying to hide that. We want that number out there because uh, though our numbers may grow, what that shows is that Louisiana is doing a great job of finding COVID where it is and so that we can have fewer and fewer of those cases that we don't know about um, out circulating in society. And when it comes to getting criteria, and, and I think the governor and I have said this uh, from the beginning, all of those criteria, and it's not just the, the ones we've talked about previously, but we really holistically look at what are the data that we have. So if we see cases increasing because we've been surging into nursing homes into different congregate settings, we need to take that into, into um, consideration with the percent of those tests that are coming back positive. Are we continuing to see that? That trend that we showed a couple of weeks ago, where as we still were increasing tests, we're seeing a decrease in percent positivity. And we also have to look at what's happening with hospitalizations, what's happening with people showing up to the emergency room with symptoms. So we don't want to back data out. In fact, we want as much data as possible, because that's how we make the best decision across all of those um, different, different measures. So it's, it's a tough question. Uh, we, we do get serology data sent to us. Um, the challenge with serology data is that right now, there's a variety of those tests that are um, available. Um, more and more tests now do have the FDA approval, the emergency authorization, emergency use authorization, um, but not all of them. And so it, it, a lot of that data needs to be um, really closely scrutinized for us to understand what that means. What we are uh, more enthusiastic about are um, settings like Oshner, Tulane, uh, LSU, and Shreveport, um, who are uh, looking at doing uh, formal studies of the population, where they're going to apply statistical methods as they're doing serology tests to understand what does that likely mean for the broader public. Um, that will give us a sense of whether uh, the, the broader public has been exposed to COVID-19 uh, to some extent. But even then, as we've talked about previously, one of the open questions that still remains with uh, serology tests, with the results that we get back, is what is the meaning of those antibodies? What, what, what does it mean that somebody has antibodies? Um, does that mean that they actually have been exposed? Is there cross-reactivity um, with other coronaviruses, like you know the 10 to 30% of the common cold that's caused by other coronaviruses? And most importantly, does it mean that those people with those antibodies are unlikely to, to be able to be reinfected, at least in the short term? Right now, based on the data that we look around the globe, we think that that's the case. Uh, but really, it, you know, we need to, to wait and see those data come in. So I think looking at those studies, those formal studies, is most important to us. Dr. Please. Lee, we um, this week have talked to some local hospitals, and they have kind of see, seen it, it fluctuate the patient intake, more so patients from congregate settings and not necessarily community spread. A percentage-wise, number-wise, what are you all looking at in the cases of in these, in these congregate settings versus that what we saw so much at the beginning of this pandemic, especially in Orleans Jefferson, of community spread. 
Yeah, so I mean, it varies by region, varies by hospital, and especially when we're talking about, for instance, the nursing home communities, we've seen uh, some companies really try to get out ahead of this and, and, and establish uh, nursing homes uh, or nursing home units that are specifically for people who test positive for COVID-19. Um, I personally think that's a, that's a best practice um, because then it means that you're really moving people out of a setting where there's a risk of spread and isolating uh, those folks um, who we know are COVID positive. So in a region where there's more of that going on, you might expect to see fewer people um, uh, in the hospital, um, but really it varies region by region. And, and this is to the point, you know, in my answer to Sam's question, when we're looking at these data and we're looking at even hospitalizations, we are looking at the data that we have from our epidemiology team to understand, well, who is in that hospital? What is behind that hospitalization rate? Um, and again, it's not the kind of thing that's easy to put on a dashboard. You have to talk about each individual trend at the individual regional level. And as we're seeing uh, more of our cases being um, uh, driven by testing in congregate settings, we take that in cons into consideration. As we see a hospital trend that's demonstrating more people who maybe are lower acuity, less sick, but need to be in the hospital driven by congregate setting testing, as opposed to what we were seeing early in the epidemic where people were showing up late uh, very ill and our ICU levels were very high, we take that into consideration as well. So it's, it's, it's a, 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 a matter of looking at a lot of data and having um, long conversations about what that looks like. Maybe. See, see the podium. Thank you, Dr. B. I did, did a great job with that. So the, the short answer to your question is the cases will never be ignored or, or you know, rendered meaningless. But, but as we increase our testing, we do expect to have more cases. So more cases in and of itself doesn't mean that we're doing uh, poorly with respect to uh, our phased uh, reopening, for example, of our economy. So you got to look at the, not just the raw number of positives, but you got to look at the percentage of positivity relative to the overall testing, where those positive cases are, uh, and, and it, in many congregant settings, they're not going to pose a risk to the general public, and that obviously is a good thing. Uh, and then how, how many of those cases are feeding into the hospital with inpatients? And so all of that comes into play, um, and that's why this is not a simple process to, to go through. Um, the, these gating criteria um, are, are numerous, and they're complex, uh, and they change over time as your testing increases. Uh, which is a good thing, because I guess if, if, we, if we were just going to uh, move forward as our case numbers decreased, we would stop testing and everything would be fine. But that's obviously not the real world, so we're never going to ignore any of that. I do want to make a point about serology testing, because there was a report yesterday where f I think four states were reporting both the testing they were doing for COVID-19 and serology testing. In their overall numbers, uh, we are not doing that in Louisiana. We have never done that in Louisiana. So all of these uh, numbers that you're seeing on, on the chart, uh, the 36,925 uh, COVID positive uh, tests, all were testing for COVID. They weren't, none of those are serology tests. We think that that gives us the best picture of what's going on. The serology testing is important too. We also have to remember that serology testing historically, and it's true in the case of COVID-19, because of the specificity and the sensitivity, those are the two right words, right? Uh, that there's a lot of false positives. And so anybody who gets a positive serology test, meaning that they may have, been, may have had COVID-19 and developed antibodies, they need to repeat that with at least one more serology test. Uh, and I think they may even recommend a test of a different type than the first one. Uh, and so it's, this, is, this is complex and, and, and so forth. But the serology testing is important, uh, but it also uh, has, a, has a, a, a higher error rate uh, than other types of testing. So one more question, and we'll go start our Memorial Day weekend. Yes, sir. Well, I, I would invite them to look at our numbers and, and see that while two months ago we had the highest growth rate uh, in the country, uh, today we are doing much better. 
uh, than other states who at, who at that time uh, had significant growth rate uh, growth rates in cases and and clusters and community spread and, and so forth those so-called hot spots um, but obviously uh, Florida's free to do what they want to do um, I would encourage people not to be doing a whole lot of traveling right now quite frankly but those people who are going to travel to to Florida they should they should expect um, I guess to, to be asked to identify who they are and where they're going. I think that's about all that they're doing uh, right now. And um, but you know they, they they can they can do what they want. I don't believe that there is any reason to do that with respect to people coming from Louisiana today. Unlike was the case a couple of months ago, uh, relative to people coming from other states. Look, I want to thank all of you again. Uh, have a safe uh, and and. Uh, uh, joyous Memorial Day weekend, but do take some time uh, to remember the reason for Memorial Day, and let's reflect, let's pause, let's let's pray for those individuals and their families who have made that ultimate sacrifice uh, for our freedom, and let's be careful out there. Remember, there's still a lot of COVID out there. We are in in uh, the first phase of our opening. Uh, we're encouraging. Um, all individuals to wear a mask when they're outside of their home and engaging with people who are, don't live in, in the immediate household with them. Uh, keep your, your distance six feet away from, from others and practice good hygiene. And if we will all play our part, uh, we will get to phase two sooner than if we don't. That's, that's what I can tell you. Uh, so everybody have a, have a great weekend and God bless.